In our recent video about the Fort Hagen satellite array and hangar, we learned that a Rust Devil raider boss named Ivy had been scavenging for robot parts at a number of nearby locations. One of those locations was a pre-war park called the Robotics Pioneer Park. In the terminal, Ivy said that her raider gang got attacked by a group of mechanist robots at this park. They also had to kill a nearby Deathclaw. I decided to go to the Robotics Pioneer Park to see if I could find any evidence of this encounter. Upon arrival, we find ourselves in a pre-war picnic area, and feral ghouls awaken to greet us. The park itself is fairly small. We find two buildings, and that's about it. But before we discount the importance of this place, let's thoroughly explore it. As a pre-war park, this place is a gold mine for pre-war skeletons. Here in the picnic area, we find one woman in a yellow dress still sitting at a picnic table. A man, possibly her beau, lies sprawled out on the ground on the other side. Instead of going towards the cabins, let's first head west. Heading west, we find a park bench with two more pre-war skeletons. It looks like a couple had been holding hands the moment the bombs dropped. It's interesting that we find so many skeletons of pre-war people who are scrambling to save themselves, and so many others of people who seem to quietly just pass. I wonder if this could mean that some people simply resign themselves to fate and wait for death to come, or if the effects of radiation acted more swiftly for some people and more slowly for others. The people who succumbed the quickest died instantly, leaving their skeletons unmoved, but those who were more resistant to radiation died more slowly, giving them a chance for panic to set in. Next, we come to some sort of shrine. On top of a tiny ziggurat, we find a statue on a pedestal. There is a plaque on this statue, but sadly we can't read it. Looks like Bethesda failed to write something for this plaque. The state of the statue is pretty bad, the head is completely missing. This means we don't know who this man was, but we can guess based on his attire that it was some sort of pre-revolutionary war figure. He's wearing the attire of a wealthy man from the 1700s. Next we come to another pre-war picnic area, only this one has grills. We find a pre-war skeleton lying on one of the tables, near to a ghoul whom we recently dispatched, and on the table is a cooler. Continuing along, to the west we find a parking lot. This is where the pre-war residents would pull in their cars before walking up the steps to the park. Here we find four blasted out vehicles parked here, and a fifth which was just pulling in when the bombs dropped. The only skeleton we find is that of a woman in a pink dress on the ground next to her pink truck. Heading back up the steps and continuing along, we come to a second park bench. This one has two men sitting side by side, and these fellows were drinking. One of them still has a bottle of Gwinnett brew near his hand, and the other has tossed his bottle to the ground. Nothing like enjoying your favorite brew on a leisurely Saturday at your favorite park to watch the nuclear apocalypse roll in. Now the water is not very deep. I got out of my suit of power armor and explored it, and there was just nothing here. There are only a few places where you can get fully submerged, but it's mainly just meant for waiting. The tree on the small island in the middle of the pond has a small glowing mushroom at the base, and that's about it. As we approach the two cabins, we get attacked by feral ghouls. Outside one of the cabins is another skeleton, sprawled out, and there appears to be a stage or some sort of podium between the two cabins. If we get too close to the western cabin, the ground begins to rumble in a familiar way. A death claw emerges from the back of the ruined shack. The Deathclaw had been using this shack as his nest. Here the Deathclaw had dragged its recent 
prey to feast upon. We find the corpse of a Brahmin and a total of three bloodied human skeletons, two inside the cabin and one on the porch. We also find a steamer trunk reward and there's a broken Protectron lying on the ground. Due to the proximity of the Protectron charging station, I suppose we can assume that the Deathclaw somehow awoke the Protectron, which then attacked the Deathclaw and the Deathclaw finished off the Protectron. Heading back to the first cabin, we can loot some Nuka-Cola from the Nuka-Cola machine outside, and inside we find a little museum. There's a display case in the middle of the shack with some robot parts inside, but all of the other display cases are empty. We also find some plaques near many of these display cases, but you can't interact with these, they don't tell a story. I guess we can suppose that this was a mini museum talking about the great advances in robotics and telling a story by comparing robot parts. Now if you unlock the terminal at the back of the building, you can read a note called Protectrons on Parade. This tells us that the Robotics Pioneer Park had a regularly scheduled event every Saturday and Sunday, Thursday and Friday that had something to do with these robots in the nearby charging stations. The note tells us that a backup Protectron is in the nearby maintenance cabin, this must be the destroyed Protectron that we found next to the Deathclaw's home. The option below allows us to activate the units. Once we activate the robots, they leave the cabin single file. I recommend asking your companions to wait outside this cabin, as they can sometimes block the doorway which will interfere with the robot AI. Sometimes the robots will get stuck in this cabin or just walk around in loops forever. But if done properly, we can watch each of these robots march on over to the stage. Each of these robots is completely different. We've got a medic robot, a firefighter robot, a construction worker, and a police officer. I went into more depth about Protectrons in my video on the topic, which you can watch here. Once they get to the stage, they climb on top of it and walk to the very end. There they stand for a moment before stepping down and patrolling the whole park. After they do a circuit of the entire park, they walk right back to the platform. This must have been the regularly scheduled parade that we learned about on the terminal. I guess people would come to this park just to watch the Protectrons walking around patrolling the area. Now these Protectrons are fully functional. If you come back with another character, and if you manage to sneak by the ghouls, you can activate the Protectrons first. They then do their circuit of the park, and they fight any enemies they come upon. This includes the nearby Deathclaw. Hostile target detected. Now I originally came here because I wanted to find any evidence of what Ivy talked about on her terminal. We did find a Deathclaw, maybe Ivy lied about killing this Deathclaw, or maybe another one moved in to replace the old one. And it looks like the Rust Devils did not get their hands on any of the robots at this park thanks to the interference by the Mechanist. But I expected to find destroyed Mechanist robots or the corpses of the raiders who died in that battle. Sadly, I didn't find anything. But in my search, I walked south-southeast until I came upon a new location called Scrap Place. This has nothing to do with robots, but it's a great place to go to get super mutant armor for strong. When approaching from the north, you can sneak into the large warehouse. The ground floor of the warehouse is guarded only by two super mutant towns. Oh. What's that? What? The activity alerts a nearby super mutant suicider. After they are dealt with, a super mutant overlord climbs down the stairs in search of you. Once dealt with, you can go upstairs to find the end of dungeon steamer trunk reward filled with randomized loot. Up on this level, you find the super mutant shoulder rags for strong. Here we also find an expert locked safe. If you walk across the loft to the opposite side, you can unlock a wooden crate. This is next to an armor workbench. 
and then heading out the eastern door, we can explore the rest of Scrap Place. Heading south, we find another shack, and inside is where we find the super mutant leg guards for Strong. On the floor is an advanced locked floor safe next to a weapons workbench. There's also a tipped over trailer with no apparent way to enter. You can climb up a ladder on top of some boxes to get on top of the trailer. And you can then look down through the broken glass to see a mattress on the inside, but there's no door, you can't break the glass further to jump through the window, there's no hatch when you explore from the ground. Um, so I'm not really sure why this is here, it's just a platform, I guess, that you can stand upon. To finish exploring Scrap Place, we can walk up the nearby wooden steps. Turning right towards level 2 brings us to a little metal shanty where we find some raw meat next to a toilet. Because nothing says dinner time than raw meat next to a toilet. Back to the steps and climbing up to level 3, we can dispatch the final super mutant here, the Super Mutant Overlord. That finishes off Scrap Place. Two great pieces of super mutant armor here for Strong, but there is one more interesting thing nearby. If you climb west up the hill, at length we arrive at an interesting scene. On the hillside we find a yellow truck with construction cones in the back. Heading up the hill, we find a forklift holding aloft a blue sedan. But what's most interesting about this is that both of these vehicles are occupied. We find the skeleton of a man lying inside the forklift, and we find two skeletons in the sedan, one of a woman wearing a dress and the other of a man in the driver's seat. This paints a picture of adultery, jealousy, and betrayal. Here's what I think happened. A hard-working construction worker comes home early, only to discover that his wife is missing. He knows her nature, however, and correctly deduces that she might be having an affair with one of his co-workers. He gets in his yellow truck, which still has the construction cones in the back, and drives to his workplace. Sure enough, he finds his wife in a blue sedan with one of his co-workers parked on top of a romantic lookout point. Filled with rage, he walks to the nearby forklift and fires it up. He picks up the entire sedan with both his wife and his co-worker inside. They cry out in panic and they beg him not to do this. But he is so angry at being betrayed, he's going to dump the car over the cliff. But before he can, the bombs drop and strip the flesh off of all of them. And then here they lie, posed in this one moment of anger passion, betrayal, and jealousy for the next 200 years. It was a dark world, this pre-war Boston. Humans are capable of great beauty, but they are also capable of great evils. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of the Robotics Pioneer Park, the nearby scrap place, and the attempted crime of passion. We have a whole lot more lore to get through, ladies and gentlemen, including the end to our explorations of the Automatron DLC. Next up, we're going to explore the Robco Service and Sales Center, so be sure to subscribe so that you get notified when I publish that video. Go ahead and leave me a comment in the comment section below. I read all of your comments and I use them as inspiration for my future videos. And if you'd like to chat about this topic on the Oxhorn Community Discord server, you can find an invitation link in the description of this video. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.